Hi everyone, my name is Michael Konjoka and I'm the Vice President of Programming and Production here at UMS in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's really my pleasure to welcome you to this, the second installment of our online kickoff to our Digital Artist Residency program for this season. And I've just taken the liberty of subtitling it a continuation of the love and joy because if you were able to be with us last night with Wendell Pierce and Cleo Parker Robinson in Tunde Alanaran, you'll know that the conversation was rich and meaningful and really just the beginning of what we hope this digital initiative will um, grow into. And I have no doubt that the conversation of love and joy will continue today with our great roster of artists that we're welcoming. Uh, performance and theater artist Brian LaBelle, his collaborator, music director and pianist Allison Devanish. Tarek Yamani, who's a wonderful jazz musician, improviser and composer, and his collaborators, the Spectral Quartet from Chicago, and then American mezzo-soprano and opera star Joyce DiDonato. We're gonna spend time with each of them, talking about the work we're gonna do together this season, and then we'll come all back together at the end to have a conversation um, as a group, and um, who knows where it will take us if last night's any, um, indication i think we'll have a lot of fun but before we start i want you to just all know i'm constantly asked i think a lot of us at ums are asked why are you investing so much time and energy and resource in this digital artist residency initiative and for us at ums it's very very clear one we want to support artists and we want to support artists right now in this moment when coming together and being with an audience is just not possible or very problematic. Two, we want to deliver on our mission of continuing to provide meaningful connections between artists and audiences. It's really at the center of what we do at UMS. And three, um, this is a great opportunity for us to be learning, learning as presenters and producers, learning as artists, learning as audience members, and really trying to figure out what this digital space means, build competency and capacity that will take us forward into the future as we move out of, you know, the, you know, the horror show, which sometimes feels like 2020. Um, we're offering all of the projects that we do with our artists free of charge to the public, but that does not mean they are free. We um, are proud of the fact that we're paying artists and we're you know, investing resource in making, resources in making all this happen. And that means that we could not do it without a lot of generous contributed support. I wanna thank UMS's sustaining directors who stepped right up at the beginning to say we're there for you and we want to invest in this um, initiative. Our board chair and his wife, Tim and Sally Peterson, have made a significant um, contribution to ensure that this work happens and that we move forward. Um, University of Michigan's very own College of Engineering under the leadership of Alec Gallimore has stepped up to you know, be there for us in this moment. And also um, we're thrilled to hear this past week that the Community Foundation of Southeastern Michigan has also invested in UMS as we venture down this road of digital artist residencies. So enough with the, uh, enough with the intro from Michael. I am excited now to invite and welcome Brian LaBelle and Allison Devanish to the screen. Um, hi, you guys, it's so good to see you. Good to be here. Good to be here. Brian's, I believe, in New York right now, and Allison is in the UK. That's right, yeah. And um, I'm gonna ask you to just introduce yourself, 
Give us just a quick overview of who you are as artists, what your practice looks like, and also really what you care about as artists. And then we'll talk a little bit about your project. Brian? Go, Allison. <laughs> Allison, go. <laughs> um, so I am Canadian born, but I have been living in London for many decades. I work primarily as a music director uh, in music theater, and I have a, an acapella group called Nitrobox that um, champions uh, the stories of the African diaspora through text and song. That's my baby. Um, my day job, however, is teaching and coaching singers um, and, uh, yeah, and working with Brian on my off days. <laughs> And Brian, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, the way I describe myself is a former American camp counselor turned performance artist, <laughs> which I think does quite accurately describe my artistic practice. Um, I, I once heard that I was a poor man's Yoko Ono and a rich man's Tino Sagal, which I found to be a great compliment <laughs> to me. Um, but my work takes all different kinds of forms. I, I am originally from the US. I am a University of Michigan alumnus. I currently live in London. Um, and my work is about the body and how it's seen by other people. And it takes all different forms, whether it's cabaret, play, musical, uh, publication, whatever. Uh, but especially during this time, I've really been trying to think about like what happens when the world needs something different? What what, how do you make an art practice which is responsive when the world says, you know what, it doesn't need that thing that you were doing before, it needs something different. And then how do I use those skills to address that new reality? Does that sound okay? We need, we need you, Brian, <laughs> we need you. Thank you for that. Um, I want to launch right into a conversation about the project we're, we're working on together because it's it's quite wonderful and complicated and um, rich and moving. I don't know that I've told either of you, but when a music teacher asked me to learn a song and sing it publicly the first time in my life, it was Caro Mio Bain. And I didn't even realize it was part of a larger collection of songs, but of course I was handed that iconic 24 Italian songs and Iria's book, and there it is. Um, and I learned it and I sang it in public. I did not have a public singing career, but um, it, it sort of reinforced the sort of fundamental role that that collection of songs plays in so many professional and amateur music makers' lives. It's a sort of moment on their trajectory. If you, Brian, could just tell us for a second about what this collection of songs means to you and how it's become a metaphor that you've used to explore your art making more broadly. Yeah, uh, so 24 Italian Songs and Aria is the world's kind of most famous music book for young people uh, with songs that are sung usually by young people, but they're incredibly gorgeous. Um, when I was 17, I failed to get into the New York State Choir with the song Amarili Mia Bella, which is a very minor, <laughs> minor tragedy in the history of the world. I, I probably never was going to have a singing career, but at that moment, I really learned when they said, you're not going to have a singing career, I realized I wasn't going I have a singing career, but I started to think a lot about this question of what's that first moment when you realize that your life was going to go in this from this direction to that direction, or this path is not going to be open to you. Um, I created 24 Italian songs. Our other collab, one of our other collaborators is Gwyneth Ann Rand, who's a magnificent opera singer uh, who couldn't join us today because she is in rehearsal, in an opera rehearsal, which is quite amazing. Um, uh, Gwen and I started to think about our pro first professional failures and what that meant. Um, what what it mean? What it meant to have someone told that you're not good enough in this moment? And starting to think about, I started from the place of saying that most stories of failure are told by great successes, are told by people who have overcome all the odds to become these gigantic successes. But what happens when what doesn't kill you doesn't make you stronger? That kind of became the, the central question for 24 Italian songs. 
Um, because I was thinking like, uh, I, I failed at Amarili Miabella. My voice was not good at Amarili Miabella, but I, I transitioned into something different. And when we started talking about it, when Allison, when Gwen and our other collaborator, Naomi started talking about what do these failures mean? There seemed to be this really rich moment that we could talk about a life that lives a very nuanced relationship to failure. That's not part of a very capitalist equation of like, you fail, you fail, and then eventually you succeed and you become a star and you become rich, et cetera. That's not always the trajectory. It's the trajectory that people want, but there's so much more nuance and richness if we can tell stories of failures in different ways. So the goal was to do that paired with this magnificent music, which is very rarely sung by beautiful singers. So you were saying, Caro Mio, oh, look this way. You were saying, Caro Mio Ben, Michael, um, uh, Seben Crudele, all of these beautiful, beautiful songs that are often relegated to uh, 16 year olds or 17 year olds who like me are not really gonna have much of a singing career. And we unfortunately don't get to hear them. So to hear Gwen sing this work, magnificent opera voice, uh, to hear that was really special. So that was really the starting point of that. And then to hear Allison play gorgeous piano music. I originally played the piano for the saw for the show and it was not good because I'm not actually a good piano player. So this is where we're at right now with the show and we're gonna be adapting it for the residency this year and then doing something next year. Yeah, I mean, the piece, the the show that you've created, the music theater show on stage is quite, quite moving. And um, it touched me and moved me in ways I frankly wasn't expecting. So congratulations on Thank creating you. something that feels that way. Um, our project this season is really not about putting the show on stage. That will happen hopefully the season after. And it's about creating this online digital archive it's of the 20 amazing. it's going to be amazing uh, we're going to make an online digital archive of all 24 songs mm -hmm. and allison do you want to um talk for a minute about the vision for this archive and sure. what you and we all hope to achieve with it well it it comes directly from brian's show and yes, the 24 songs are the thread that goes all the way through. And the idea is that all 24 will be recorded. But also with that is a conversation with the hopefully variety, the wide variety of people that we're asking or hoping to ask to be part of it. And the other thread is that everybody, we hope that we are in contact with have some of these songs at some point, probably at the beginning of actual careers or hoped for careers. And then we're, we want to talk about failure. And I, the word failure always makes me shudder because it's like it comes with big neon lights and you know a big drum roll of, and horns. But failure for us, for Gwen and I who will be doing the archive is also a catalyst for change and choice. And I think that often we don't recognize or acknowledge the fact that where we are now is because of something that happened before. And it may not have been hugely tragic, but it's pushed us to just another direction. And also that's okay. So we would like to, we hope to be talking to people where this is the career, they, they managed to keep going with their singing and they are huge and it's successful and yay. Um, there are people who started out again with these 24 and great hopes and dreams and possibly came out into other areas of the arts. And then those um, unknowns, I think, who, who again started in the same place with this same book of songs, but something just turned in their life. Um, whether it was huge or not, whether it was deemed a failure or not, and they've ended up elsewhere. So we're going to really end up with these sort of 24 modules in this website that then over time can be crowdsourced and everyone Absolutely. can contribute to uh, telling their own personal stories of failure, but also contribute their own iPhone rendition of singing one of the 24 songs. And um, it will go on for centuries and become this sort of intergalactic phenomenon. Absolutely. Um, as you can tell, we could go on forever and ever. So I'm gonna um, get out the hook and pass it off now to my colleague, Mark Jacobson, who's the senior 
programming manager at UMS and Tarek and members of the Spectral Quartet. Yeah. Take it away, guys. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a pleasure and honor for me to reintroduce both the Spectral Quartet and Tarek Yamani. This collaboration has really come about um, as a continuation of UMS's exploration of performing arts from the Arab world and its diaspora. Many of you in our audience might remember Spectral Quartet from our UMS Accordion Festival at Hill Auditorium, <laughs> um, where Spectral Quartet graced the Hill Auditorium stage. They're a Grammy-nominated string quartet based in Chicago, who really push the boundaries between tradition and contemporary practices in their work. Um, Tarek Yamani is a Lebanese pianist, improviser, and composer who is residing in Berlin. And Tarek actually was our first, unfortunately, COVID-related cancellation of last season back in March, uh, even though he made his way from Berlin to Southeastern Michigan um, and got to participate in some residency activities in Dearborn. Um, so welcome to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank Hi, you. Mark. Hi. I thought we would kick it off uh, um, by reminiscing a little bit about um, the meeting between Doyle and Tarek um, earlier in, in 2020. Yeah. Uh, so I've been writing essays for UMS now for the program book for three or four seasons. And Mark approached me uh, to do an interview with Tarek. And I, at that point, had not come across his music. And I owe Mark a, a huge debt of gratitude for introducing me. Um, the story is kind of funny just because of our time differences. The interview ended up happening at 5 a.m. for me. So poor Tarek was uh, subjected to my gravelly, groggy voice. But, you know, we had this incredible conversation that was probably 75%, you know, on, on target about the piece that we were writing. But um, the other 25% was just really talking about the bigger issues in music. And we just really hit it off. I think maybe 20% of the interview made it into the program book. Uh, so it was just a big sweeping conversation. And like all interviews, the first thing I do is go hunt down everything I can uh, that the artist has done. And my first stop uh, was Tarek's album Peninsular, which if you're watching right now, the first thing you need to do after this presentation is go listen to that album. It was an absolutely mind blowing experience for me. It just spoke to me in so many different ways. Um, the micro tonality just uh, it just appeals to you so much of what I care about in music and the the sheer creativity was just absolutely astounding. Wow, thank you so much, man. That's uh, that's uh, that's a great uh, what do you call it testimonial. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna quote you on my website now. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I I. You know, I've been doing a lot of thinking recently um, <clears throat> about the relationship, the mentor-student relationship, mentorship and apprenticeship that is so critical and essential to the performing arts and music in particular. Um, I, I know, it's, you know, in jazz, we have our heroes and legends. Tarek has shared the stage um, on International Jazz Day concerts with Herbie Hancock. And this is how the how our forms are passed along um, and evolve. And <clears throat> I was uh, gonna ask Claire Lyon, if uh, um, violinist in Spectral Quartet, if you could give me some examples and maybe some history of Spectral's uh, recent collaborations. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think you really hit on something to us. Uh, being a good collaborator means being a good student. It uh, means uh, being willing and open enough to, uh, to really um, invest yourself and to uh, not have expectations about what you might be learning, but to be open to uh, changing perspectives. So um, a couple of collaborative works that we've been uh, working on, I would say in the last three years or so, is we've had a, a really deep and rich collaboration with Miguel Zanon, who is a... Uh, 
New York based uh, Puerto Rican jazz saxophonist. And he wrote us a concert suite of pieces that explores Puerto Rican jazz, uh, musical culture, and um, it's extremely rigorous and, and fully uh, integrated, um, I would say, uh, stylistically with what, and, and, and I would say also expands what the string quartet can do um, in a particularly interesting way. Another collaboration that we've worked on recently that um, taught us a lot about different musical styles is with uh, Natalie Joachim, who is a also um, Brooklyn born, uh, but uh, of Haitian descent, uh, vocalist and composer and flautist. And she also wrote us a, a beautiful suite of pieces called Femme d'Aïti, which is about um, women, the uh, stories of women in music in Haitian culture from the 20th century. And it's just a really beautiful work. And we have been uh, touring both of these works for the last three years or so, but we're so excited about this collaboration because of what Doyle already said. I think it's going to be extremely rigorous. Um, we've had some some chats with Tarek already about what we might do and the idea of being able to be fluent and versatile enough in his style to improvise in microtones is definitely going to be a, a huge challenge for us and one that we're really excited about. I think we said initially that we wanted to avoid Charlie Parker and strings at all costs, right? Like slapping a string quartet onto, you know, something else. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're after something different, right, Tark? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be more like, uh, I mean, you're going to be the, the main instrument basically. So the string quartet is the one instrument in a way. So uh, and 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 we say microtones. Uh, uh, it's specifically quartones, actually, because you know Arabic music. Uh, you know, like microtonality could be any. You know, there's there's so many ways we can play microtones, but quartones is more like the half between two semitones. But it's not the exact half. It's actually it's it, it varies between cultures. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I'm so looking forward to, ex to experiment with that uh, with you guys. And by the way, I've never. I mean, I don't want to scare you, but I never written for a string quartet before, so. <laughs> <You're> gonna... <laughs> uh, we need to have a sidebar real quick. <laughs> you know, I waited. I waited until the live. You know, the live kickoff. Right. So, so you can, so you can head back out now. <laughs> no, but I love that. I mean, that's exactly what Claire is talking about, right? Is like it's a learning yeah. process for both collaborators, and I think there's just so much more. Um, just it makes it so much more fertile. I think as you come together. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the things that that we were thinking at UMS all along is it 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 can't it's not just any ensemble who um, is able to respond um, to to certain conditions. Um, there's there's a lot of energy and in, in sort of um, unspoken um, willingness to experiment. Um, so this digital artist residency at UMS in and of itself is an experiment, and then we have this collaboration that's brand new it's a novel collaboration between um uh, artists that that might seemingly come from disparate uh uh places within the performing arts um and backgrounds but yet because of your openness and the energy that moves between you um there's a lot of um synergy a lot of potential for synergy and i wanted to just uh talk to Chuck a little bit more specifically about um, the anchor project of this digital artist residency. So we alluded to uh, the fact that you're gonna be uh, commissioned to write uh, an evening length composition um, um, that will premiere at UMS, that will be for string quartet and keyboards. Um, and um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more details about um, what you're thinking and sort of the creativity um, that you've been uh, brainstorming to go into the composition. Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, it's a little bit uh, a, a little bit too early to tell. Uh, I mean, the way I work is more like a kind of like a, a strike of uh, like uh, like inspiration that that when I, when I, when I'm in, I just I just go for as as long as possible. And uh, so, but but I do have a lot of. Um, visualizations in mind and I've and I've actually had a lot during I was recently at a meditation retreat and I had no access to anything 
except for my my mind basically and uh, and somehow i spent a lot of the days imagining music and and i was mostly imagining uh music for this particular project nothing was written down i forgot everything but i think i <laughs> i think i started a very very interesting process because i don't think anything gets lost it's like uh, it's like practicing and then sometimes you know whatever you practice comes comes out in 10 years you know it doesn't have to come to, to come out the same night you know so uh so yeah what i imagine is a very it's, it's hard to it's hard to uh, it's hard to put into words, but it's uh, but it's gonna be cool. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, we should we should say that part of this part of this collaboration is we want to invite uh, the UMS viewing audience and whoever is watching into the process. And so we thought the best way to kind of kick that off would be to do. We've been doing these listening parties that we call the floating lounge in Spectral, and uh, we're gonna do versions of that. A couple of them to kick things off and Tarek will show up with a few tracks. We'll show up with a few tracks. We'll listen to them with an audience and everyone will get a chance to react and to ask questions and things like that. And it's, it's a way for the audience, I think, to get a little bit inside of what we would do personally before starting a collaboration, which is really kind of go full immersion uh, in that person's musical world. And, and these two listening parties are going to take place on Wednesday and Thursday, November 18 and 19. Um, they'll be online um, and there'll be 60 minute listening sessions. And it's just going to be, I think there's just going to be a world of, of uh, a sonic world is going to open up for, for UMS audiences. So I want to thank you so much, uh, Tarek, Clara and Doyle. We're going to be hearing from Tarek and Doyle later on in this broadcast. And right now I'd like to bring back my one colleague, Michael Konjolka for a conversation with digital artists Residence American Mezzo Soprano, Joyce Di Donato. Hey, Joyce. Hi, Michael. How are Thanks. you? I'm great. Good to see you. I'm, um, so I'm inspired a... by these people. <sighs> it's pretty cool, huh? It's so cool. Well, I I just want to um, divulge something that happened backstage for our viewing audience. Doyle Ambrus made no bones about the fact that he was having a fangirl moment that um, he's with you on this um, digital kickoff and I will throw myself into that ring as well. It's such a pleasure to have you as part of this project. We feel really um, honored. I want to thank Doyle for, because that did me a world of good. I like I walk around the house because it's like six months without applause, right? And I never considered myself an applause junkie at all. I was like, I'm all in it for the art. And I find myself going, don't you like the way I stacked the dish <laughs> Do you think I deserve applause for how I've cleaned the dishes and done the laundry? Yeah. So clearly I am going through a little bit of a, a withdrawal. So Doyle, I love you too. And Michael, well, you know how I feel about you. I'm a big fan. Super sweet of you to say. So I got to kick it off with just a, a question to get us talking. Um, and I'm just going to sort of boldly put forth an idea that um, is very personal. I have taken such great pleasure over the years in listening to you and witnessing you on stage. And um, it makes me immediately reflect upon this notion of the false binary that exists between the interpretive artist and the creative artist. And we all know in the world of opera, one of the very first things you're charged with doing is interpreting a score, interpreting a text, and interpreting a character and bringing it to life. Yeah. Um, the creative artist, on the other hand, wants to make something new out of the material they find around them. And I can't help but just recognize out loud the interest you have in existing in both worlds. And I just sense that you're always pushing against the interpretive arts into something that feels truly creative. And you have a real need and interest in mining the treasure trove of opera and song to say something new about the moment we live in right now. Is that true? Do you feel this? I sense I sense this in you as an artist. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean, it's, it's um, 
it's a little unnerving to hear it described that way because for me, I just feel like I'm working, like I'm just doing right. work. Um, but to hear you analyze it that way, I, I do think there's a lot of truth in it because I'm, a, despite how I started this conversation, I'm a very reluctant um, spotlight person. I, I like to communicate and I like to be in direct contact and reach people, but the star quality or spotlight thing makes me nervous, you know, and I don't, um, that's not where I want to stay very long. I, I got into this because the world of opera and classical music has been this fountain of, well, it's been a great teacher to me, quite honestly. Um, the poetry, the characters we have to, to go through, the, the huge mountains and seas of emotions and spiritual aspects of the human existence is, is what I find in these works. And so it's never been enough for me just to do it the way it's always been done. And worse, play to the expectations of the listeners. In the opera world, we have this fantastic tradition, which on the one hand is what makes us so grounded in, in the human story, but at the same time, it can be so inhibiting as an artist because we're expected to do what everybody thinks, how it goes. You're talking about the 24 Italian art songs, right? We yeah. all learn how they go. That's right. And that, that's a little bit of a straitjacket, I think, as an artist. And so part of it was, I think, also going back to Brian's conversation, I was a big failure at the start of my career over and over and over. And I didn't hit my stride until like my early thirties. Um, and, and so that taught me that nobody was gonna do this for me. And the traditional way maybe wasn't my best friend in going forward into this art field. But at the same time, I worked a lot early on in new music, particularly with the Houston Grand Opera. So that yeah. creative bug got planted in me very early. And I'm so grateful for that because it's easy in our world to stay with the pieces written 200 and 300 years ago. And that doesn't, that doesn't interest me. Yeah. So I started just giving myself permission because nobody in this industry will give it to you. That's, that's right to give myself permission to say, to ask questions and to look at things slightly differently and to say, I wonder what this looks like and I wonder why that is. And, and that's been in these last few years where I've gained the confidence to go forward in that way have, have been incredibly fulfilling artistically for me. And actually has, at the same time, it's not fulfilling because it makes me feel like there's a lot more I wanna say and a lot more I wanna do. Well, we want to make sure that we create a space for you to say a lot more. And, um, you know, that's really one of the goals of our digital artist residency. So let's do it. I've been so excited about the conversations we've had about the project we're going to develop together. You out of the gate said, if there were ever a time that was operatic, it's now. And um, I know that you have been thinking a lot about how to tie this treasure trove of song and opera to our contemporary moment. And maybe you can just describe for folks a little bit what you're thinking about and what we're going to try to achieve. Well, this has been on my mind um, for a while, going back to when I developed the War and Peace project that we took around the world was to create something artistically really meaningful. And ooh, I wish there was a way to not use the R word, but because mm, we're carrying this on our back in the opera world, like a heavy yeah. thing to, well, are you relevant? I just, yeah. that is, it's, it's um, we're the most relevant thing because we talk about the human condition. However, not everybody realizes that we're relevant. Yeah. And I think I don't want to be a part of the industry that sort of softens it and, and, you know, dumbs it down, for lack of a better word, to make it palatable. I want to go into the eye of the storm and show how relevant we are because we're telling the same stories for the last 400 years and we're doing it in a way that bypasses here and goes straight into the heart. So artistically, I wanted to highlight 
instead of talking about it, I just want to do it and say, see, this song addresses what we're living right now. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I'm, I, I feel also a little bit of a responsibility to be a part of the solution or, or looking for the solutions in our industry. We're a little stuck and, and in the recording industry and in classical music, we're all looking for the ways to, to move forward. And I think um, this, this bill was gonna come due at some point. And I think this, the last six months have just, has just accelerated that. How can we use the mediums and the, the tools at hand right now to take our art form into the living rooms and the hearts and the ears of, of different people in a meaningful way? We all know it when you see the big TV shows like American Idol or The Voice, everybody goes crazy when they hear Nessun Dorma because there's something, it's like watching the Olympics. You're seeing the greatest constructions of the human spirit. But we just, we've missed the the link a little bit about how to put that into everybody's daily life. Yeah. What well, I hope I... to do with this, sorry, what I hope to do with this is, um, is to use this music that I sing to put it into the context of the daily headlines. Yeah. Because as I said, 2020, we are living a, a living opera in all of its exaggerated, heightened passion and fear and and everything that we're all all feeling. And so I want to use some of the music that I know and bring in other people on the other side that might have a hand in the headline and yeah. see if we can't find some common ground, some empathy, some understanding, some comfort addressing the headlines of today. And the, one of the tricks is not talking right now about what those specific headlines are because we want to keep it really spontaneous and in the moment. And we're going to have to challenge ourselves to really figure out how to address something in real time and bring the song forward and create those moments. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah, well, live art, you know. <laughs> Not live in front of an audience. At least it can be live in, in, in real time. I think it's it's going to be a challenge. And I'm, I'm so grateful to be a part of this this experiment and this and this adventure with you all. On behalf of everyone who loves opera and classical music, I want to you know thank you for really taking this idea of relevance seriously because without that without addressing that issue um we'll all be the lesser and it's just i'm glad we're leaning into it gotta yeah. lean into it yeah it's the moment i think that um it's now time to bring the party and invite everyone back into the room. And- um, We got everyone in the house. Everyone in the house. I'm hopeful that everyone has a question and I don't need to really um, steer this, but um, does anyone want to kick it off by asking one of your fellow artists a question? I have a question. Go for it, Joyce. Brian, this idea of failure, like what is the, what is the, I don't know if you can take it down to one single thing, but like the greatest thing that you learned from one of your most spectacular failures? Well, I I don't want to inappropriately play the cancer card, but I'll just throw it out because when I was young, I had cancer. And I had cancer at the same time that Lance Armstrong won his fourth Tour de France. Mm. We had the same cancer, we had the same doctor. And I remember thinking like, surviving is not gonna be enough because now I have to be bigger, stronger, faster, which was always the great lie that he proposed, right? That like, not only he was like both medically better, he was more interesting, people's families are better. So actually my work, because I really don't, this is the first time I've ever created a piece of work around music. Um, And usually I create work around illness, around themes of that. But they're really relevant because for me, it's this idea of like, I I remember this, this 
this difficulty, this trauma when I was 20 and I was a student at Michigan. And I was like, oh, but the worst part was the pressure that was there to say, oh, now your body is, is lesser than it's had a problem. And now you have this pressure to like be happier, have better relationships, have, have like bigger successes. So it was kind of like, and always my advice to people who have been sick is like, don't listen to any of that crap. Just like, just let yourself be beyond. So a lot of this work, although this work is not a cancer story, it has nothing to do with that, is really about, about not worrying about getting more than afterwards and just saying like, I've, my body has failed in some way. A testicle had to come out, some chemotherapy had to come in. <laughs> and like, you can just calm down, you can just like be okay. You don't have to be better. So I think that in relation to, I hope that answers your question, but I've had a lot of professional face plants I mean, I, I performed at Covent Garden. It was the worst gig of my life. <laughs> I mean, it was just like all these different things. But, but that was really where I think that that comes from. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Oh, well, good, because I've got a question for you, Joyce. <laughs> so we can flip it back like that. My question for you is, this is a real opera convention that I've never quite understood but you were introduced twice as an American mezzo-soprano. What does this mean to you? Uh, I don't know if you watch the debates, if it's interesting for you, <laughs> if you lean into American mezzo-soprano, because as an American who lives in the UK, they always say, I'm an American artist who lives in the UK. And I, I I don't know. American isn't a job. Tanya El Khoury, brilliant artist, <laughs> always is known as a Lebanese performance artist. And she's le she says Lebanese is not a job. It's just <laughs> a nation. So I'm, I'm curious uh, to hear your thoughts on that. How much time do we have? <laughs> Thank you. I, I, thanks for that that answer. It wasn't at all what I expected, but, okay. <laughs> but um, it resonated a lot with me. So I appreciate that. You know, I, 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 haha. I mean, I'm sure all of us here and all the artists, we are trying to figure out what our role is right now because the arts have always been the leaders in these kind of moments. And I, I try to be really objective about where I come from and what I do. And in many ways, I am 100% the poster child for the American dream. I came from low middle class, white suburban, uh, easy upbringing, seven kids. I worked hard. I paid my way through college. I got a scholarship to conservatory. I ticked all the boxes. I worked really hard. You know, I had three jobs in college and at AVA in Philadelphia. And, and I worked my way up. I was pulling myself up, well, even though you can't with the bootstraps, and, and I made the leap and I made a pretty extraordinary career materialize. And me much of that was due to the American system. And I'm grateful and I'm, I, I have no problem being that kind of a poster child because there's an element of that that is real. Then you go out into the real world and especially the gift of this time, I think, as painful and as revolting and vile as so much of it is that we're seeing, we are seeing it and it's undeniable. I took one of these bias tests that Harvard um, puts out because I thought, well, I'm gonna be a good ally and I'm gonna do my homework. I'm sure I have a little bit of white bias in me, but probably not that much because I'm active and all of this. and. My, and, and, I, and I grew up in a family where racism was never, everybody, we were taught everybody is equal. We were taught to respect everybody. But, you know, it was really, I, I grew up in quite a liberal home. So I thought I'm in pretty good shape. I had a very strong bias towards the white race. And I was even trying to figure out the quiz when I took it. And this was three months ago. And... I was horrified and I was grateful that I had that kind of cultural slap across the face 
because even I'm consider myself one of the good guys in this and and in tune and trying to do good things for social justice and for all the things I've been involved in. And I needed to know that the culture had a much stronger hold on me than I was willing to give it credit for. So long story, I have a love hate relationship right now with my country and I'm grateful and I think it's capable of so many extraordinary things. And I think it has so much work to do and it has to begin with me. So when I'm identified, I mean, I, I live in Spain currently. Um, I'm coming to you from Spain. Uh, I'm part proud of being American and I also feel a huge responsibility to represent my, com my country in a way that the country itself is not representing itself. Um, and more than that, I'm a citizen of the world now, and I don't like the labeling. I don't even like the labeling of mezzo-soprano, but the labeling of America it just cuts things off and it carves it up into pieces and it puts us in boxes. And ultimately, I'm a fan of eradicating those qualifiers, quantifiers. Long answer, I'm so sorry. Right. Brian, Brian right, went right for the big, big questions. I love Sorry. it. <laughs> no, I love it. It was wonderful. Uh, can I ask Allison a question real quick? Sure. Um, I, I, I'm first of all, really inspired by your project and the reading that I've done about it. And then hearing you talk about it uh, today, uh, both you and Brian. And I'm wondering with the archive that you're putting together, the first place my brain goes is that I'm wondering if there's a motivation there to give agency to people to approach something that they might feel is out of their reach, if that has any part in this at all, in terms of the kinds of singers that you're hoping to attract to the project. Ultimately, maybe it's you know the second or third phase, whatever. I think that, I, I mean, I think I mentioned when we were talking to Michael that I don't like the word failure mm -hmm. so much because it always seems to be underlined and very, very strong, very negative. And so your your question about people who think it's out of reach, first of all, they, I hope that they, as I said, the one thread is that at some point they sang one of the 24. Um, and then the idea is to find out what happened after that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that especially probably for people where they've ended up coming out of the arts completely, that there is, something about having sung that or studied or just studied singing in itself that is, um, you know, there, there, something happened along the way, whatever it is. But I, in an ideal world, I would hope that it would feel more like coming home mm. as opposed to approaching something so fearful. Mm -hmm. I mean, singing itself is, a joyous activity, whether you are a professional singer or you're humming in your bathtub. And I would like to think that both the opportunity to talk about how they've ended up where they are now, um, that the because the anchor is the 24 songs, that it's more like coming back to a comfortable place mm. as opposed to, you know, opening the door really, you know, <laughs> looking through and going, oh my God, yeah, I think we, we all have those things too, that even if they are part of the change in our lives, there was a reason that we started there in the first place. And that should be the comfortable, safe place. And I think that singing is that. I'm saying this not as a singer, by the way, because I, I don't think I do sing that stuff. So it, it is that, that's where we all come home to. I, I love that storytelling aspect to it. And I feel like that's maybe a common thread for all three of these projects is, sort of contextualizing, you know, these sounds into something really deeply personal, right? To give it a, perhaps a new angle to, to view it from. Yeah, I think so. I have a question. Um, if there's one thing that we can agree upon in this time that seems to be defined by no agreement, it's that, um, we need to find a way forward together. What do you all imagine the artist's role could be in helping us 
the arts um, do so many things, but they ultimately benefit us and and hopefully make us healthy. As artists, do you, I, this is a crazy philosophical question I know, but do you imagine for yourself a way as an artist you can think about leading us forward? <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll give a, a quick, because you opened up the door with philosophy. I'll just give a quick one thought because there's a lot of problems here I don't I don't know how best to solve through the arts, but I know it's possible. Harmony sound waves. We're all involved in creating sound. And at a fundamental level, that that exploration of the micro harmonies and the dissonance into harmony and that rub against each other and then finding a chord where the overtones sail. At some primal level, that is going to speak to people that hear it, even if the message is perhaps um, not what they came for. There is just by creating the vibrational sound waves in dissonance and harmony, I think that can have a big effect mm -hmm. on people. I think that the, the question itself is 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 like a, a little bit irrelevant because that, I don't think that's like how it works, you know, like the way the way things just develop. Like it's like when you have like a very interesting conversation where only a few people are listening to and it's an illuminating experience and you you might wonder like how is this gonna change the world? That by itself is not really the right question in a way because because you do it because it's the right thing to do. That's it. It doesn't matter if you affect millions or you affect two people. It's the right thing to do, so we do it. You know, and and in a way, I think that's that's what artists are like. We, there's always this this notion that art should change the world, but but still, like that's like it's not the way to look at it. Art should be done because it's the right thing to do. That's it. You know. End of story what effect does it does it do that's we leave we leave it yeah. you know like you throw seeds in a, in a uh, on the ground yeah some seeds make a tree some seeds don't make it you know and then this comes back to failure uh we we look at failure uh am i am i am i disconnected now we can uh, hear you uh, okay <laughs> but you do look frozen uh, okay i don't know what happened so uh, so yeah so that's that's the same with i mean, I mean the, the, the thought i was having about failure is that uh, it's also like we, we 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 like to like put uh uh so much weight on to, on certain things that are just part of the way it is so failure and success is just it's it's a man-made concept you know it's like do we look at the glass half full or half empty yeah you know so, so when you look at failure we're giving failure a weight that it should not have anyway to begin with, because that's what life is anyway. Again, it's like, I mean, creation itself in a way is, is a million failure and one success, you know, the one sperm that makes it, makes this a human being, you know? But so, so but what about the others that didn't make it? We don't talk about them, but they are part of the process because without them, you know, there wouldn't been happen this one success, so. We have a question from the audience. And um, people are just wondering what art, music, or art of any kind has really been helping you cope with the um, past six months, and what has kept you inspired during this very, very strange and difficult time. Is this a question to everybody? <laughs> it is anyone, anyone. You mean besides watching Lovecraft Country? <laughs> I mean, I, I love the story of, of Brian, this, this whole like watching sex in the city with, with people in bed. Is that true? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I watch changes? sex in the city with people via Zoom. Um, I've been doing it for years, but it, it's, in this time, it's been really, really important. I think that um, that's a nice thing to do during a pandemic. 
Yeah. Anytime, Tarek. I've got a recommendation for you. We can do it. Um, <laughs> uh, I have to say, I've been very moved by artists who have been part of kind of mutual aid programs and people who are really, you know, saying like, actually, I have a platform and I also have an ability to pick up, you know, Ten, a ton of flour to be distributed by people who need flour right now. So I've been really moved by, there's a lot of that in the UK. The UK government has been horrific, like the US government in caring for people. So anyone that's been involved in these kind of efforts has been really great. Um, but the other thing is I have been very inspired by um, a group that used to be called, um, sorry, they used to be called, uh, welfare state. They were they do large scale festivals and public things. They also do amazing creative rituals. I've been training with them to lead funerals and weddings over the last two years, and I found it like a really great extension for my artistic practice, which mm -hmm. really helps people in very different ways. So whether someone needs a uh, a Sex in the City recommendation or a funeral led by someone during a time of COVID, I feel like. Somewhere between those two things are inspiring yeah. art for me and good TV. Exactly. exactly. That sounds crazy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> for us, for us in Spectral, uh, when this all first started happening, um, you know, we were heading into our biggest uh, spring touring season to date in the 10 years that we've been a group. And mm. uh, I don't say that to uh, solicit empathy or, or sympathy, but um, it, it, caused us to really take take our time actually before we started doing things online um, because a lot of what we saw especially early on and that's i'd argue even a lot now is very one directional um people trying to perform for a camera and then broadcasting out and i get it um and that's sort of a version of of what performers can do but our our whole goal in all of this and everything that we've done online has been to make things two directional, really to include the audience, which is what we do at shows. Um, so it was a natural fit for us, but really like having people's voices, literally bringing them on screen with us, you know, to ask their question or to have a reaction to what we're talking about um, has really, that's been the thing that's uh, I think really kept us uh, kind of artistically motivated. I was, uh, when this pandemic began, um, my, our colleague Brian and our my colleague Gwen and, and I started talking about the panic that seemed to be ensuing in live arts, live performers of the you know I will never perform again and my life is over and I'm going to die, and it made us start to contemplate the whole idea of why we do what we do, and who it's for, and how we do it. Um, we wrote a blog because we were just talking to each other too much on the phone, so we decided to actually write it down. And I think what we, the conclusion at this point in time in our present six months in, is that there is a magic to this pandemic, that it has forced or enabled this time of reflection and peace. We are coming out, artists doing various things in a variety of ways online, here in the UK, opera companies have been performing outside on steps of churches, etc. But what I've noticed is that there's a lack of rush and hysteria to get it all done yesterday. I actually started playing the piano again. I always play the piano, but what I mean is that I've been playing the piano for myself. And I haven't done that for years because I've always been working. And I, you know, I began the pandemic saying, it doesn't matter if I ever play again, it's all over, you know, I have my health, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not concerned about somebody hearing me play the piano. I am totally taken with what it does for me. And if anybody else happens to walk by or hear it, that's fantastic. If they get something from it, as Tarek was saying, you know, you put it out there, you plant the seed, somebody else accepts it and receives it, how wonderful. But I feel quite good with what I'm doing, and I'm hoping that in feeling good with what I'm doing, it then extends out. We all have to do my head to care, but it's, 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 it's the time now that I have to do my art for myself. And if I can fill that vessel, then it can go forward. I might um, jump in um, because yeah, 
Tarek, I loved how you described we do art because it's the right thing to do. That is so well stated and heartfelt. And Allison, I'm with you a little bit. I, um, I had this sensation when this started that the directive from mother nature was to be quiet, mm -hmm. to be quiet. And I, there was this rush to put things on. And I, I'm normally fairly active with social media and I've actually pulled back quite a lot because there's so much happening. And I thought pretty soon it starts just feeling like noise. And again, that pull to attention going in so many different directions. So interestingly enough, I've turned to silence and nature much more than than um, thing, music that I put on my headphones. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that's there. And I too have sat down at the piano for the first time in so long just for that, that experience for myself. Mm -hmm. But the silence has been really nurturing and has allowed the, the voice of creativity to start to to roar mm -hmm. and to come back. But I think it's genuine creativity and not the, the necessity to produce something. Yeah. I think we all discovered the, the magic of slowing down. Yeah. I know I know we have to wrap, so so that's all I I have to say right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you all have been so clear and generous and vulnerable in talking about um, you know, what this has all felt like and been like. And I can't thank you enough on behalf of UMS and our audiences to, you know, share in this way. I think even that is that is a gift that um, is um, very precious. I, um, I wanna thank the staff of UMS for helping to make this happen. I obviously wanna thank our supporters again for ensuring that all of this is funded in a way that it can be the best it can be. And I also, I'm gonna go off road here and I learned that tomorrow is Brian's birthday so I also want to wish you a happy birthday, Brian. Thank you very much. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Brian. Yeah. Happy birthday. Do we feel and like the birthday bunch here, right? Yeah, yeah. it is. Sorry. <laughs> a boy named Brian. So I look forward um, to us all being together again very soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Michael. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, you everyone. everyone. Thank you. Be with you. Right. Talk to you later. You're amazing. <laughs> Doyle, thanks for the fandom. Okay. You're a superhero, I can tell. I can't wait to read cool. your book. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.